Well, we're gathering this morning on this wonderful Friday, April 15th, 2022, what we call Good Friday. And also, Good Friday marks the start of Passover, which will carry on over until April 23rd. And so now we have this, this you know, Christianity, Good Friday, coming in with what the Jews are still celebrating as Passover. And the reason why we're in Exodus this morning is because often as Christians, I don't think we take enough time or pay enough attention to the fact that what Jesus did upon the cross and how it connects to Passover is absolutely important, excuse me, imperative for us to understand. Christians like to use a lot of terms. We say things in Christianity that sometimes we don't necessarily understand to the fullest. We use terms like substitutionary atonement. We use terms like, you know, the sacrificial lamb. And when we talk about these things, we don't give a connection. We often think sometimes, well, you know what? Calvary, and yes, it is a New Testament ish like, situation, but we don't think that God is continuing to unfold and do something in which he has already shown us in times past. When we read the Old Testament, when we read the laws, when we read what took place, when we read about the festivals, we can actually see how Christ fulfilled those very things and that they were a foreshadow of what was going to come. And so we're going to try to look at this this morning and get our minds in this wonderful amazement of what God has done for us in the demonstration of Passover and that we're going to connect it to what Christ did at Calvary. The reality is this, my friends, Jesus went to the cross. We know this. And when we look at the cross, we need to understand the wonder and amazement of it all. It's not enough just to sing about it. It's not enough just to confess it. It needs to get deep inside of us for us to truly understand. And so my job this morning is to take us on this wonderful Friday morning is to go through and take a journey back in Egypt. We're going to go back to Egypt for a little bit. We're going to have some discussion on what was going on there so that we can come back into the New Testament mindset and look what was going on during that dark day at Calvary. And so the time we're going to go back to is the day of the kings. It's the day of Pharaoh. In fact, the word Pharaoh just means the Egyptian king. But we're going to go back to a time of Pharaoh and Moses. And when Pharaoh and Moses, they grew up together, but Egypt at that time was polytheist meaning that Egypt's had many, many gods. They worshipped all kinds of gods, in fact, and some of the more common gods that you may recognize from your trips to the museum or watching the National Geographic might be Anubis, you know, the god with the jackal head, and you always see it when you're watching Egyptian tology or 80s music, you know, walk like an Egyptian, it's got the jackal head. This might be familiar, but also the god, the sun god, which sometimes is in Sphinx. So when you see Sphinx, and you see that kind of like lion head or body with the human head, excuse me, that's Amun-Ra, that's the sun god. And so there's many more gods, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but no doubt that Egypt was a polytheistic society, so polytheism was their religion of choice. It was in the land, it was the overtone of the culture, and so naturally their priests and their sorcerers are polytheists, right? They believe in multiple gods. You can kind of get an understanding of what Egypt would have been like by living in Mississauga. On every corner, there's a temple, there's a religious society, there's something going on, there's New Ageism, there's all kinds of people professing one thing or another and throwing up all kinds of ideas under the sun. So we get this little glimpse, but it was much more because it drove their society, this uh, polytheism. And so the land that we're talking about here, all of a sudden, We look into the Bible, and now we also learn that Egypt used foreigners as slaves. We know that foreigners were used for the purpose of building up this city, and Israel was no different. When you start reading through the account, you would understand that Israel was there for some time, and a transition was taking place that during the time of Israel in Egypt, they were used for slave labor. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, it actually speaks about this task, the taskmasters, excuse me. Pharaoh brings up these taskmasters, and their job was to inflict Israel, okay, so the Jews living in Egypt, with hard labors. 
the harder, though, those officers inflicted Israel, they multiplied. They continued to grow. They continued in their number, so much so that it brought concern against Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh decided that he is going to be the conditions even harsher. He was going to use excessive authoritarian type of rule over Israel and really, really give it to them, as it were. If we need a kind of a modern day understanding, loose, think of North Korea. Think about what happens when you get caught with the Bible in North Korea and you're put into an imprisoned uh, internment camp where you do slave labor and it's backbreaking labor. And if you don't do what you're told, you will be beat night and day, night and day, and it's just really, really hard. So there's this issue going on here. Now, leaving aside Moses' birth and everything else, we know that by uh, Exodus chapter 3, God tells us in his word that he is bringing about a mediator. Okay, I'm going to use a lowercase m on that mediator. And this mediator, his name is Moses, and this is all happening at the burning bush. And so here is Moses at the burning bush, and in verse 7 of chapter 3, we read these words, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. And so if we want to know how bad it was for Israel in Egypt, we know it was bad enough that they were crying out to God. They were crying out in this infliction. And so we can already know that the taskmasters that were put over them, these officers, these, these servants of Pharaoh, were absolutely cruel. And the Lord heard their cry. And it's interesting why he heard their cry. There's that little word because in here. And this, it's, without getting too technical, it's a casual preposition. And so basically what's going on when you see this word because, you realize that it indicates the object of something happening in the scripture. And so now we have because God is going to do something because of something that has been done. So God now is expressing his attention to Israel because he heard Israel's cry. This is what's causing God to move here. The seaka, this emotional distress that Israel has. They are being, there's anguish in their bones. They are crying out to God because their taskmaster is cruel. And we have to understand, even for our current day and age, that Israel was beyond their ability to relieve themselves from that taskmaster. So the cry that's taking place here is the cry in a sense of all humanity, isn't it? Because Israel did not have the power in themselves to remove their burdens. They could not remove their burdens. And so when we read this word because, it is telling us that God is now acting and will show their deliverance from their afflictions. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Basically, only God can remove Israel. Only God. And how does he do this? God comes down and delivers Israel from the power of the bondage of the Egyptians. And he's going to do so through that lower M mediator by the name of Moses. Now hold on to this. Because Jesus was sent, why? Because we have a great taskmaster. We are in bondage to sin. And humanity cannot, no matter how hard they try, deliver themselves out of the hands of that taskmaster. So there's a connection here already in Exodus with our story. But as we go through the pages, we will learn that God, re God will reveal through his servant, and that is the Passover, that there will be a deliverance of his people. It's an amazing thing. So from chapter 3 to the end of around chapter 5, there's a lot of back and forth going on of how the story is going to unfold, how Moses is going to come before Pharaoh, and how Pharaoh's heart indeed was not softened, but it was hardened. And as his heart became hardened, it became worse for Israel. It did not become better. And then all of a sudden, we get to chapter 6. 
This is really quick here. We only have a certain amount of time this morning. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, I want to read. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Let's just stop for a second. God's saying he did everything that he said he was going to do, and it did happen. That's important. Back to the text. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgment. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land to which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so this is powerful. This is what Moses is going before Pharaoh with his understanding. He knows he is being sent by God, and God is about to work. And he also knows that he will not, in his power, deliver Egypt himself. The only way Egypt is going to be, excuse me, Israel is going to be delivered out of Egypt is through the powerful hand of God. And just like we as Christians, we know there's no way to become saved unless it's God himself that does the delivering. There's no effort in mankind to ever deliver us from our sinful state. So now we move forward. We're going to go forward now, and I want us to start looking at the signs and the plagues and which is leading up to Exodus chapter 12 to where we are, and there's a reason why we're doing this. So we start to read of the accounts now of Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh. And one of the first things we see leading up to the plagues is that Aaron, in Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 to 13, he basically throws his rod down because Pharaoh is demanding a sign, right? He wants that rod to be turned into a serpent. And so Aaron does that. The rod goes down, and guess what happens? If you know the story, you know that this rod turns into a serpent, but you also know that Pharaoh's sorcerers were able to perform the same trick. And so the game has to get ante in a sense. It's the stakes are going to get raised. And so then we come to the first plague, basically, in Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 to 25. And here, the water is now turned into blood. And the reason, this is an interesting plague, because all of a sudden now, you know, remember, Egypt is polytheist, right? They have many, many gods. And now here then, all of a sudden, the goddess of Hapi is being challenged, because this goddess is the, is the source of food. It's the source of life. It's the source of the economy because it's all connected to the Nile. The Nile was the lifeblood for Egypt. So if the water wasn't usable, the economy is going to crash. And so not only is this water turning into blood, but in this judgment of God, he is showing them very clearly that he is indeed God over all, even over their goddesses. But, like Aaron's rod, guess what? The sorcerers were able to duplicate this account. But do not mistake that God's judgment was here. There was no drinking water for seven days when this took place. But we continue. Then all of a sudden we go from here to the frogs. Now, if you know anything about Egyptian culture back then, frogs were also sacred. It was considered the goddess of birth, Exodus 8 to uh, 1 to 14. So we learn when this judgment occurred, God is again getting the attention of every single person living in Egypt, both Israel and the Egyptians and any other foreigner in the land. And basically, once again, God is not just showing them a judgment through a plague. He's coming against their false belief system that he alone is God. And what they're messing with, the Egyptians, by messing with Israel, is messing with the one true God. And then, 
the gnats or the flies happen. This is the third judgment. It's also an amazing thing because now all of a sudden, the skeptics are silenced. The sorcerers are done because they're now seeing that they cannot mimic every single thing that God is doing. In fact, in Exodus chapter 8, 19, it says, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord said. And as you continue through the text, we start to realize things are heating up in Egypt and there's becoming a clear distinction. And if you read carefully, you're going to see that we're now getting into a more clear separation between Israel and Egypt for what is about to come down the pike and start coming against these individuals who are dwelling in that land. In Exodus chapter 9 verses 1 through 7, it talks about the fact that all the cattle died. But not all the cattle did it. Israel's cattle was spared. This is another attack on their false religion. It was coming against the fact that God is destroying them and getting their attention. And yet Pharaoh's heart is still hardened. Then we move on to Exodus 9, 8 through 17, the plague of the boils. And this one is, to me, is really, really cool because we know that only Jesus Christ has the power over death and sin. But yet for the Egyptians, Isis was their God of power and of love to overcome death. They actually believed that Osiris was brought back to life and Horus and everything else. And in this polytheism of what they had, all of a sudden God is now plaguing them with boils and ill health on an epic scale. And so much so that even those false teachers, those sorcerers, those who are holding into this Egyptian nonsense say in Exodus 9-11, excuse me, the scriptures say, The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians. Friends, imagine the entire city of Mississauga being completely taken over by boils, and you're walking around Mississauga the way you look right now. Do you not think there's going to be conversation, confusion, anger, lack of figuring things out? Why is this happening? But yet Pharaoh's heart was still hard, and we continue on. This demonstration of God, and all of a sudden, God is going to do something now. He's really going to step it up, so that Egypt will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the previous six signs may have shown that you know, God can do things on the earth, but now it's going to even step up even more. Because now he's going to show he's the Lord over all, over the heavens and the earth. There's going to be no more misunderstanding of the power of the almighty God. And all of a sudden, the plague of hail comes down. Hail on epic proportions. And then all of a sudden, Exodus 9, 16, it says, but indeed for this reason I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. That's that's amazing. Well, it's not enough, is it? We know our Bibles. We know that the locusts come. The locust is actually the eighth plague. And again, now this is an attack on Osiris. And then all of a sudden, the ninth plague comes around. It's attack, on, on, it's attack again because now we have this, this darkness coming in. The darkness has been said by many theologians and historians that probably the winds that brought the locusts in also stirred up a big massive dust storm and caused darkness on the land. But either one way or the other, we know it was a sign from God and God is now showing Egypt, oh, and by the way, I'm more powerful than Amun-Ra. Let's get their attentions here. And so this is the setting. All these plagues have taken place in Egypt. Egypt, Egypt, Pharaoh, the citizens, looking at the Israelites, not even harmed by the last of those plagues. And now, in their polytheistic view, has been utterly destroyed by God. And there is chaos in the land. There is confusion in the land. And they're wandering around, looking at their livelihoods, their religion, everything that they hold on to, and thinking, how can it get any worse? And then all of a sudden, things are about to get really, really bad. 
because the final plague is about to hit. So in our reading, in which Tony did for us from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, we read about the final plague. And the final plague was the deliverance of Israel. And so let's just look at this for a couple of minutes because we learn from the account in which was read for us that on the 10th day of the month, Israel was to take a lamb. Verse 3, chapter 12. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th day of this month, they're each to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Well, why? Why? Have you ever asked the question, why were they to take that lamb? Well, it's not entirely clear when we read Exodus 12 this morning to why they possibly need a lamb, but there's going to be a couple reasons behind this, and one of them is do not forget that Israel was living in Egypt. And we know then, it is safe to say, they were probably contaminated with the polytheistic uh, religion of the Egyptians. They have probably incorporated in their their own religious doings ways of Egypt that displeased God. Now that's a pretty big jump. And how do I come to that about this part of scripture? Well, if I go forward to the Ten Commandments of Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 and 5, it says very clearly to Israel, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on earth or beneath or in the water under the earth. Sounds kind of interesting, doesn't it? The jackal frogs, the sphinx. And so something's happening here. So we go back to this installation of Passover. We can safely assume what is going on in Egypt even over at the Passover and that even Israel, though they are going to be spared, are also worshiping some of these false gods and goddesses of Egypt to some degree. But even if that can be debunked and even if they were not, guess what? They're still sinners. Because everyone born into this world is born under original sin. And so God here is showing that he is gracious and compassionate. And at the same time, he is showing that he is holy and just. And that he is not simply going to overlook sin to simply deliver Israel. Something is going to have to happen. There needs to be a sacrifice. Very, very important. Why is there a need for a sacrifice? From the very beginning of Genesis chapter 3 with the fall, when Adam and Eve knew they committed sin and they hid from God, what did God do? He killed an animal animal so that they could be covered. We know about the sacrifice that we read in Genesis. We understand in the New Testament, the author of Hebrews in chapter 9, 22, telling us, and according to the law, one may almost say, Um, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so there's something going on here with Passover. Passover is a beautiful thing. It's about forgiveness. It's about cleansing. It's about this sacrifice. God is going to deal with iniquity. Do not ever mistake that. But at the same time, while dealing with iniquity, he's extending mercy. And grace. That is our God. And because of that, there needs to be a lamb. And so in Exodus chapter 12, we learn that that lamb is to be unblemished, tamim. That's very important. Without defect, a physical defect, it, it has to be perfect. It can be taken from the sheep or the goats. In fact, the sacrifice is so serious, and the perfection of that livestock had to be so proper, it required a four-day examination to make sure that that lamb was proper. Exodus 12, verse 6. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So they didn't just rush into this. They didn't just grab a simple lamb. Any lamb will do. It had to be the spotless right lamb of their flock. The best of the best that they had. And as the count goes forward, we learn that all of a sudden it had to be killed at Ariv. Twilight. It's all tying in, isn't it? 
Now, twilight here for us is, is different in our day and age, right? Because we look at time frames differently. But the, the day ended for Israel at sundown. So the killing is happening at dawn, at twilight. It's not happening at 2 o'clock in the morning like many of our movies make us think. It's happening at a time because in the ancient world, things were still dark, things were going on. But this is the twilight. It could have been a little bit later, but it's not happening at 2 o'clock in the morning. And if it is, I'll be corrected on that, and I'll preach on this another day with that correction. But the lamb had to be perfect, and it had to be killed. But it just didn't have to be perfect and killed. The blood had to be put upon the the, the two uh, doorposts that were coming up and down in the mash cope that comes over, like that finishing piece on the door. And so the blood was put on there by by Israel. And then all of a sudden, we read from verses 7 to 11 this. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat of the flesh the same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That's, that's important. Hopefully I can get into that today. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, at any, um, or boiled at all with water, but rather roast it with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. There's a lot going on in those few verses. There's not just the sacrifice, but there's also a sacrament going on here. It's interesting how God is doing this. Because when you're reading the account, your mind should start going on what's going on later on with Israel and things that are also being established. But let's first talk about the sacrifice. The blood is to be upon the doorpost and the lintel. This was the sign that God's judgment will pass over those on the inside. They were still sinners, but the blood would pass over. Think about the ark. Wrath and judgment was taking place, but it passed over them in that ark. That's the best that I can do. Israel was secure in the provision and the grace of God inside those homes. Verse 12 says, For I will go through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and against all the gods of Egypt, and I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Now there's a difference from the twilight when the lamb was sacrificed until later on when God is doing something. But what's important here is this, and please pay attention if you're a visitor online or in this room. God did not pass over Israel based upon their merit or who they were. He did not pass over them because of the people inside of that house. The merit was not theirs to claim. The merit and the Passover took place because of the blood of the innocent that was put upon the doorposts. That's very important. It was the blood of another that allowed Passover to take place place. Israel, were, they were sinners just like us. They were no better than the Egyptians, and they got affected by some of the plagues, but not all of the plagues. They were better because of God's covenant, but they were not better people in a sense. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so they were better off. It was the blood that covered them that made it important. We cannot lose that thought process. When your friends ask you, why do you Christians keep singing about the precious blood of the Lamb? It's because the blood. It's all about the blood. And that's what we're getting in this. So, through sacrifice, there is substitution. And through substitution, there is salvation. And that is true even today. Do not lose that. Sacrifice, substitution, salvation. But it was also a sacrament. Because we learn in the account that it was communal. 
they ate. And we know that Israel had the annual reminder of what took place on that Passover. Even to this date, our Jewish friends are gathering until the 23rd to celebrate Passover and to remember what God did for them when he took them out of the land of Egypt and delivered them. We do the same thing as Christians, right? In our sacraments, we call it the ordinance of communion. And we take the bread, which symbolizes the broken body of our lamb. We take the cup, which represents the blood of our sacrificial lamb. We do this in remembrance of Christ until he comes again, until we sit at the marriage supper of the lamb. We remember just as their deliverance was at hand, our deliverance is also at hand. But back to the text. For Israel, their deliverance is at hand. For them, there was no more waiting under that great taskmaster. Pharaoh's day, taking them down, is over. To the point, in verse 11, it says, You shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded and your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Have you ever wondered or asked the question, why are they dressed in this manner? They were dressed for departure. God knows this is it. God's not relying on Pharaoh to change his mind. God's already told Moses, I'm going to bring this guy to a point where he will change his mind. And now it's come. Israel, get ready. You're about to be released. Connection to the New Testament church, we're supposed to be, we are, if you're redeemed, clothed in Christ. And we are to live in the same mindset because of our sacrificial lamb that our departure is close at hand. Jesus talks about this in Luke 12, 35 to 36. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. A lot of connections going on here. So how does all this fall into place then with the crucifixion of Jesus? This whole journey that we just went on, how does this affect us as New Testament people? Well, friends, may I say to you that an animal was never the final solution. An animal was never the final solution. An animal's blood was never the ultimate way in which salvation was going to be achieved for humanity. The author of Hebrews makes it very clear. Hebrews 10 verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This was all foreshadowing. It was the demonstration of what our God was going to do through his son Jesus Christ. He alone is the one who takes away sins. Hebrews 10 19. Therefore brethren since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, our Lord. That blood was spilt at Calvary. And what took place at Calvary is good. This is why we call it Good Friday. It is good because just like those Israelites that were in Egypt could have faced the full wrath of God against them just in that final plague showed no, what happened. God, being a God of grace and mercy, covered them. And just like it is for us today, we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You as a Christian do not need to plead the blood every single day. You do not need to beg for the blood every day. It's not a daily cleansing. You have, if you have repented of your sins, have been cleansed by the blood of the most precious lamb. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Each person who is born is born under original sin. We get that. The scriptures are clear. The scriptures tell us that the soul that sins shall die and the wages of sin is death and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That alone teaches us that Passover is an amazing account in which we also get to recognize through Jesus Christ because the goodness and the holiness of God is being displayed all at the same time on that wooden cross. The Passover is a demonstration of what God, as I said, was going to do once and for all. And that's how we get tied into this. Because all of humanity is slaved are slaves to sin. 
We can't rid ourselves from that bondage. We can't do anything about this. Just like Israel was under a great taskmaster and their wages were too steep, we are also, as I said, under that great bondage. So what we're reading here is that God is indeed a God who deals with sin. We cannot forget that. God deals with sin. What we learn from this Passover and all those plagues that I was leading up to before chapter 12 shows us very clearly that not only does he deal with sin, he smashes idols. He destroys strongholds. He is the one who directs the kings of this earth to fulfill his purpose. And at the same time, he shows by his power and by his might that he is the God of deliverance and he always delivers his people and he always hears the cry of his elect. It's not a matter if we accept it or not. That is reality and that is true. And so like those in Egypt, in the New Testament church, we will see distress We will see plagues. We will see chaos. But we do not lose heart because we know God is the initiator of our salvation. And just as he did before, he is doing it again. He sent his son to be the mediator, capital M. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is the true mediator. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Christ. So, sorry Catholics, out of luck on that one. It's all God. I can hear the words of a friend of mine right now, so let me phrase that. Sorry Roman Catholics, it's all God. Love you, buddy. All right. So God did not just send us a mediator like that of Moses, because Moses had sin. He sent his son who knew no sin, to deliver his people. This is why John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did he do this? Have you thought about how our salvation is in connection to the display of Passover? Did God ask us this time to pick out our lamb? Did he ask us to pick the lamb of our flock? the best lamb? Did he ask us to examine that lamb for four days? Did he ask us to slaughter that lamb? No, not at all. God sent the lamb. God slaughtered the lamb for us as our substitute. Isaiah 53 But in Isaiah 6, 9, it tells us very clearly, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. This is why John 3, 16 is beautiful, for God so loved the world that he sent, he sent his son, so whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This time, new covenant in which we are in, The Father provided the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. This Lamb came at Christmas. This Lamb was laid in a manger in a stable. Friends, there is no better fitting place for our Lamb to have been born than in the manger. It all points back to this. Jesus, truly God, truly man, our Passover Lamb. He came into the world for us. And so when you read Exodus 12, you realize that Egypt was a time of chaos and confusion and disorder and all kinds of nonsense was going around under Pharaoh and God showed up for his people. We also know that when Christ came and was born into this world, he came during a time of great chaos. He came under the time of Roman rule. And once again, Israel and others were under the oppression of a great taskmaster. And we all are still under a world of chaos. And we know he's coming again. 
And so when we look at this issue of the Lamb of Exodus 12, we understand that Jesus is the only one who can qualify as the Passover Lamb. He is the only one who is a male. He is the one who is without blemish. He is the one who is found spotless. 1 Peter 2.22, it says, He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Now hear this. Amen. In Exodus chapter 12, we learn that the Lamb's blood of the Passover was to cover the doorposts. But Christ's blood dripped down that wooden cross at Calvary for our salvation. It's the same thing. Without the blood have cleansed you of your sins, you are damned to death, which is hell. He was slain for our sins. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from futile way of life, inherited from, from some forefathers, but with the precious blood of as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. This is why Paul declared that Christ is our pass, uh, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. And so here's the reality, my friends. And for those who may be watching online, Good Friday is not good if you're not in Christ. You're like you're like those living in Egypt. You're witnessing the frogs and the hail and the locusts and the darkness. You are witnessing all these things taking place, but your heart is getting hard. You're like Pharaoh who ignore each time God addresses idolatry and sins. And even though he could wipe anyone out like that in a heartbeat, his warnings go unheeded. There's no blood over your doorposts because there's no blood over you. And because of that, death is awaiting. It's waiting. You might be thinking, oh, whatever, pastor. I'm fine. For now, you may be. Don't forget the end of Pharaoh's existence. Don't forget what happened to Pharaoh's army. They were fine for a while until the Red Sea swallowed them up. And for many people, they're playing with God. And the Red Sea, in a way, will one day swallow them up. But for those who have cried out to God for deliverance and salvation, you are the ones who have been justified. In a sense, like the blood over the doorpost, you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, you are soundly saved. And therefore, you are not better than anyone. You are just better off. Because you know that your salvation is not based upon your work or your merit. Just as much as Israel could not get out from the bondage of Israel, they could not release themselves or deliver themselves from that cruelness you know it's only God that can deliver you from the cruelness of this world in Christ his substitutionary death brings us salvation his sacrifice his substitution our salvation let's go back to Hebrews 9 for a moment and we're going to close this up verses 11 through 15 but when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes and heifers and sprinkling those have been, uh, been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the, the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgression that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Our Good Friday. Our Passover. It's all connected. But here's another little quick warning before we close this. Many this Good Friday are grateful that Christ died. You hear a lot of Christians say, I'm so thankful Christ died. And a lot of people who are religious admit that Christ died. But we read something very carefully in Exodus chapter 12. I want to go back to that because in Exodus chapter 12, it wasn't just enough for the lamb to die, was it? 
No, the blood had to be applied to the two posts and the lintel. And likewise, the blood of Jesus Christ must be applied to the believer, and we call that faith. The believer must apply that sacrifice by faith. That's the gift of God. The Holy Spirit regenerates the heart and opens the eyes. And you call out and say, I receive what was done. I get it. I understand. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ as the substitutionary lamb slain so that God's wrath can pass over us. So mark my words, listener, if you are not in Christ, you have the full wrath of God ready to be poured out on you on your death. And it will be the most terrifying thing that you will ever experience in your life. But God being good has given you a way out and that is through the death of his son. You look to Christ. You look to Christ, the Lamb, who bore our griefs, who carried our sorrows, who was stricken and smitten by God, the one who was afflicted and pierced for our transgressions, the one who was crushed for our iniquities. That is, can be applied to us by faith. Faith that the blood is our forgiveness. It is what we need. We are like those Israelites living in Egypt, needing this needing to be covered by this. So a true closing now. Let's go back to John 3.16, but put two more verses attached to it because it's so important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Pay attention here. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. That can also be condemned. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. All of Egypt, the firstborn males. Just <laughs> but those who are covered by the blood believe. And so, dear friend, if you're listening to me this Good Friday, I want you to know it's all about Christ. When you read that Passover account, go back to Calvary. Listen to the words of Jesus. Listen to what he is saying when you read that word. Look and picture the events that are going on. Connect the events. What was going on? That last Passover lamb, why the veil was torn. There's so much more that I have not touched on or I can have you preach on this morning to connect all of this. But I want you to know it's all the work of God. In Exodus, it is the work of God. And today, it is the work of God. Christ Jesus is the only acceptable substitute in which our salvation rests. You need to understand that before you leave here this morning. All God, always God, forever God. 